Well, hello, this is Dr. Stan DeCoven with the Walk in Wisdom program, sponsored by Vision International University. And we're so glad that you're uh, a part of our teaching program today. <clears throat> and let me just review for you the whole purpose behind Walk in Wisdom is uh, based upon the Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, which simply says that we're to learn to walk in wisdom both without <clears throat> and within. That doesn't mean without money. It means with outside with the world. We need to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves, but also walk with wisdom with our fellow believers, to live life in a way that will bring glory to God, <clears throat> but also blessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So. Anyway, we just want to welcome you to the Walk in Wisdom program. Uh, we've been working on a series that we call Journey to Wholeness, and it's based upon, <clears throat> well, a couple of things. Number one, it's based upon my own life journey. I mean, when I was first saved, I was told, and later when I was filled with the Spirit, I was told so clearly that, listen, once you have this experience, everything in life is great. Well, in some ways, life was great, it was wonderful, I was blessed, heaven was my home. But in reality, I still had lots and lots of things that I struggled with in my personal life. I struggled to be the overcomer that the Bible says that we are in Him. But <clears throat> I learned that, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. The main which is that God never intended for the one event to be all there is. But his intention was very clear, and that is we start the journey as children, and the goal is not perfection, that is where we never do anything wrong, but it is maturity. God has called us as brothers and sisters in Christ to come into the fullness of our maturity. Now, uh, so I began to do some Bible study, some research on this, and part of it was prompted by my studies in psychology. I was reading especially some of the developmental theorists, including Eric Erickson, who had his eight stages of psychosocial development. But as I began to look at that, and then later, or perhaps almost at the same time, read 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, I saw that, gee, in the natural, there's developmental process over time, there's, there's things that have to be learned, but also we see that in the spiritual. There's a developmental process, and there's lots of things that have to be learned for us to come into the fullness of our journey. Uh, in Ericksonian's way of looking at it, or psychology, it's coming into one's integrity as a person, into uh, completeness. In the Bible, it uses similar terms, wholeness, sozo, completeness in God. And it's, again, it's not an event, although it starts as an event, and in some ways, <clears throat> it is an event. In the sense of, once you're born again, you are fully a God person. But, as a God person, he wants us to fulfill purpose in the kingdom of God, which is not in heaven, it's here now, amongst our brothers and sisters, and in the world in which we live. And so John was writing about that, the, the apostle whom Jesus loved, according to his own confession, uh, was simply stating that, uh, you know, some of you that I'm writing to are children. Some of you I'm writing to, you're young men. Some of you I'm writing to are fathers. And with the fathers, which we're going to talk about today, fathers, mothers, it's really mature believers. <clears throat> and in some ways, John has given a, a wink, wink, a nod, nod. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Because you've been through the journey yourself, and now you're in a position to help others in their journey to wholeness. Because all of life, from a Hebraic view, it's a continuous cycle where we go from glory to glory, change, transformation, until we see the Lord. So, we've talked about children. Now, we recognize that children have needs. And they're, you know, kind of useless when they first come into the world. They, you know, they take, they take, they take, they take. That's all they do. But... Parents recognize what a great honor, what a great privilege it is to have a child and what a responsibility it is to nurture and love them, care for them, feed them, discipline them, make sure they get everything they need to grow in a healthy way. Well, so it's true in the church. We as spiritual leaders are responsible, and that's a 
key word. We are responsible for the new baby in Christ. When they come into the church, they don't know much. Maybe they know Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. They, uh, they may be rough around the edges. They may not understand what the language is supposed to be like in the church. You know, hallelujah, God bless you. If I were any better, I'd be in heaven. And other Christian, Christian cliches that we often use, they don't know that stuff yet. All they are is raw. Here I am, take me as I am. And the church needs to be willing and able to take people where they're at. Their children. Great potential incredibly loved by the Father, and it's our honor, it's our responsibility to help them grow into maturity. So in First John, or in St. John, sorry, chapter 1, verse 12, it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even those who are, believe on his name. Well, we all start as children. So John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, I write to you children because... Uh, your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. Well, and I write to you, children, because you know the Father. The word there to know the Father is different from the know the Father that he says to fathers. It's a different word. It's one more of the ability to identify. I know who my daddy is. I know he's big. I know he's powerful. I don't know what he does. I don't know where he goes during the day. But I know I've got a, a good, good papa. And I can identify who that is. So as we talked about, children, I mean, they know, need to know they're forgiven. They need to know they're loved. They need to know they belong. But they also need to know that in time, they are expected to grow, to step into areas of responsibility in the family. And as they continue to grow and learn a few things, eventually they come to a place where there's a testing to determine their character, their level of faith, are they really going to follow and make Christ fully Lord of their life. We call that the wilderness. And we use the type or the picture of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, you know, across the Red Sea, symbolizing baptism, the, the blood of Jesus, baptism in water. They came to worship. They experienced the presence of God. They received the word. All of those are foundational things that we see repeated then in the New Testament. But they, the goal was to give them what they needed foundationally so they could make the journey, not a 40-year wandering around the same mountain over and over and over and never entering into the promises of God, but to be a 40-day trek where they, by faith, enter in and possess the possessions that God has for them. Obadiah verse 17, if you want to look that up, that's a great verse. Now, so... We know that God wants us to live the overcoming life by being strong, having the word in us, dealing with the twisted character. So we come into, again, we start with our identity, or excuse me, our intimacy with God. We come into our identity by dealing with our iniquity. But the long-term goal is to come into the fullness of integrity or wholeness and experience our inheritance. Well, let me just cover a few thoughts regarding fatherhood, because I, I think it's very important. John again writes, he says, I, I, I want you to know him. Now, to know God, the Father, is to know Jesus, the Son. We all know that from Scripture. Jesus said, if you've seen me, seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. So if we want to know what the Father's like, we want to look at what Jesus is like. And what we have is the gospel stories about Jesus. Uh, again, referring back to, to John just for a moment, the Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Now that's a longer teaching that we're going to have sometime in the future, but grace and truth, that's who Jesus is. Well, if that's who Jesus is, that's who the Father is. That's who the Father is, that's who the Holy Spirit is. And if that's who the Trinity is, then that's what the church is supposed to be as well, full of grace and truth. Now, they go together, but grace comes first. But truth is also essential. And truth is more than just propositional. It's more than just beliefs and attitudes, although it includes that. But it's relational. It's knowing Jesus. So Jesus, I mean, from the very beginning, I think had two primary motives. And I think true fathers in the Lord 
should have two primary motives. One is to fulfill their purpose. Jesus' purpose, we know, was the cross. Nothing. I mean, he set his face like flint on the cross, and nothing was going to keep him from reaching his destination. But secondly, he realized that he only had a short time to pull this plan off, the plan that had been planned from before the world was formed. And so he recognized he needed a team. He needed others that would come alongside of him that he could impart himself into who would take the same message of the kingdom and expand it to the four corners of the world. And of course, that's what he did, that, his disciples. So as a father, as a spiritual leader, what should be our heart? Well, we better know who we are and what our specific calling and purpose and destiny is. And we should be hard after that. And make sure that nothing hinders us from reaching that goal, which is easier said than done. But secondly, we also have a responsibility for the next generation. So the father is the one that's able to take children and nurture them, help young men to become overcomers so that they can become fathers as well for the next generation. Now, the, the, the choosing of sons and the Lord and all that is talked about a lot nowadays, but really it's a, you know, it is, it's, it's a difficult thing sometimes because, you know, Paul, as far as we know, had only a few spiritual sons. Jesus had his 12, of which one turned out to be demon-possessed, and there was the 70 or 72, depends on which version you read, there was eventually the 120, the 500 that saw him before he ascended. So there he, had a, he had some influence. And God really wants us to be people of influence as well. So one of the stories I love about you know, being a father uh, is found in, in the book of Mark chapter 1. And I want to focus this because I believe that the heart of a father is ultimately a heart of compassion. The word compassion means ultimately love in action. And Jesus was love in action. That's what he was all about. Everywhere he went, he was doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And God will be with us as we go about doing good and healing those that are oppressed of the devil, working with the next generation, he'll do the same thing. But anyway, let me just tell you this story. I, I just love this story. Uh, of, the, of the leper. Now, the story of the leper, and that's what he's identified as. We don't even know <coughs> who this guy is. He doesn't have a name as far as we know. But, but this person who was diagnosed with leprosy uh, was, a, was a man of great courage. And we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. But, you know, prior to that, if you remember the story in Mark chapter 1, we see that Jesus, who's just starting out his ministry, he's already chosen a, a few people to follow him. He hadn't fully chosen them as the twelve, but there were some following him, one of which was Peter and James, John, so the, the, the brothers. They're going to Peter's house, Peter's actually mother-in-law's house. And uh, when they arrive, they find that the mother-in-law is sick, She's got a fever. The Bible says that Jesus laid hands on her, touched her, and she was healed. And immediately she got up and she made lunch for him, which tells me a very important principle that most great miracles are very practical. It was lunchtime. The boys didn't know how to cook. They needed someone to take care of lunch. Therefore, we better heal her because it's lunchtime and we're hungry. But also one of the things we see is what a remarkable miracle this was, because the Bible says that the entire city, now in those days around that part of the world, a city might be only three to 500 people. But still, that's a lot of folks coming into a, into a house that was probably no more than 10 foot by 10 foot. We're talking about a small house. And everybody from the city came to see. Now I'm guessing, I can't verify this for certain, that the reason they came to see this incredible miracle because they figured if a mother-in-law could be healed, nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help that. Anyway, after this great miracle, everyone's coming, and the Bible says that Jesus healing and delivering. Casting out demons, healing the sick. Now, I don't know, uh, you know what kind of circles you run in, but if you are, have been a part of anything remotely charismatic or Pentecostal, 
you've seen a few things and we've seen a few things like I don't know about you but you know when I minister someone who is sick and they get healed normally they just say oh well thank you very much that was very kind have a nice day okay not really they go ah can you look I'm healed glory to God they're loud they're happy now Maybe some of you have even done some deliverance ministry. I mean, when I've prayed for people that are demonized, guess what? I mean, because I have such a powerful anointing, I tell them, you cannot talk, be kind. When you come out, just get out and go away. And they go, okay, sorry to bother you. Uh, I'm leaving now. You think? Now, ah! So if you could imagine in a maybe 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 size house and you got people that are rejoicing and dancing and shouting and happy and people that are demonized and yelling and screaming I mean this was the best show that had ever come to this city and of course the the next day after the all the ministry was done the Bible simply says that Jesus snuck away he went to a quiet place to pray see the priority of the father the priority of every spiritual father is relationship with the father. It's your prayer life. It's your intimacy with God. We never lose the need to develop and strengthen our intimacy in God. Jesus needed that divine connection. If he needed it, how much more do we? Of course, we see the problem with people, especially with men. I mean, the disciples, they went out to find Jesus. And they said, Jesus, aren't you aware of, of all the people are looking for you? And he said, well, that's nice, but that's not what we came out for. See, what the disciples were looking for was a repeat performance. I mean, wouldn't they look good if Jesus did it again? But see, Jesus' purpose was to eventually get to the cross. And in the meantime, he had some disciples he needed to train and equip including the ones that were with him. And so rather than focusing his attention on what might have brought Jesus some fame and even fortune, he continued to move down the road under the direction of the Holy Spirit, under the direction of his Father. Now, we don't know much about this man called a leper, other than I think he was a man of courage. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, in that day, leprosy was a horrifying disease. I mean, leprosy still exists, but there's medication for it now. But, but at the time, there was no cure, and it was, uh, there was a whole lot of things that you had to do in Israel if someone became a leper. Much of the book of Leviticus talks about that. Well, here this man, who would have been a member of the household of faith at one time, was diagnosed as having leprosy. I don't know how it happened. Perhaps one of his friends noticed some changes in his skin, notified the priest. The priest would have investigated. Indeed, he found the man was leprous, at which point he pronounced over him, you are a leper. You are no longer a member of the household of faith. You must go to a leper colony. You're unclean. And most of the time, the family would go with them because there was no way for the family to live. And there they went together into a leper colony, where from that moment on, whenever they walked down the street, they'd have to cry out, unclean, unclean. And the assumption was that anyone that, was, that had leprosy had leprosy because either of secret sin in their life or because God had cursed them. Well, I, I, I hope... As Christians, we've come a long way from that kind of ridiculous way of thinking. Sin may be the cause of sickness and illness, but ultimately we live in a sin-sick world. And all we know is that when sickness comes, God's grace is greater and his power is greater to heal. Anyway, somehow this man... I mean, he was different than the rest of the lepers in the community in which he lived. Maybe he heard about this remarkable healing of a mother-in-law and decided, well, you know, better than rotting away here in this stinking hole, I'll go and try and find Jesus. Now, he knew the risk. That's why I think he was a man of courage. He knew the risk. He knew that because of uh, Jesus being a rabbi, he could have easily picked up stones and had him stoned to death. But again, perhaps he thought better that than rotting away one piece at a time. And so this man of courage takes off and begins to move in the direction of Jesus. 
Uh, no doubt when he got closer, he would have been crying out, Jesus, 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 because he didn't know what Jesus looked like. And eventually Jesus would have turned around and saw the man coming at him. We don't know what he looked like. He could have been pretty frightening to see. And no doubt the disciples got out of the way so that the man could get to Jesus. And I always find it a great thing when God's disciples get out of the way so people can get to Jesus. The man falls down before Jesus' feet, would have actually probably grabbed a hold of his ankles, looked up into his eyes, and said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I am willing. Are you kidding? I'd die for this. I'd die for this. He laid his hands on him, broke the law, healed him. And you know, you would think that Jesus would have taken this moment to say, wow, look at the power of God. Look how incredible this is. But his concern was not about himself or his disciples or his own ministry. Because immediately he tells him, listen, please do me a favor. I've, I've got a really busy itinerary. I'm traveling to different towns. I'm already getting a little too popular. I don't want to get to the cross before it's time. So please do me a favor. Don't tell anybody. Could you imagine? I mean, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people, if they had a remarkable miracle like that happened in their church or happened in TV or whatever, they would be, boy, they would want to pronounce it, look what the, look what the Lord has done. Yeah. But not Jesus. Because he was more concerned about the man being restored in the kingdom of God than he was about his own reputation. You see, people that are real fathers and mothers in the faith, the faith, their concern is not about themselves and their own ministry because they recognize, I'm here for a season, but my life continues, if you will, through my disciples. And so he tells the man, listen, do what Moses commandment. Go to back to the priest. Take an offering and give glory to God. Now, I don't know how the man thought about that, what he felt about it. I can almost picture it, though, if you can think about it this way. Could you imagine he kind of comes and, you know, knocks on the priest's door. And he, he has an offering to give to him. And the priest opens the door and looks at him and says, can I help you? He says, remember me? No knows. I'm back. <laughs> what was Jesus interested in? Well, he wanted to make sure there was no bitterness in the man's heart. He wanted to make sure he was free, that he forgave. And part of the forgiveness is the giving of the offering necessary to show that, wait a minute, I was lost, but I'm found. I was blind, but I see. I was leprous, but I've been healed by the wonderful, marvelous grace of God. And he was rest restored back to the community. You see, what, what fathers are interested in is seeing that kind of restoration. Later, as Jesus began to raise up his apostolic company, and you see this in Mark chapter 3, the Bible says he went up into the mountain and prayed. And already there had been a large group of people following him because we're very impressed with his miracles. And maybe they'd had lunch and, you know, had some fish given to them and all of that. So they, he had lots of people following him. But he recognized he couldn't build with a large group. And see, fathers recognize, I can't build with everybody. I have to be selective with who I'm going to partner with in life and in ministry. Remember, John said, I write to you children, young men, fathers. I write to you fathers because you know him. In other words, you know his purpose. You know his ways. You have, your identity is firm in him, and you have the same basic orientation that the Father has, which is the great commission motivated by the great commandment. The great commandment is love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. The neighbor, the good Samaritan, all of that fits into that. Fathers, they look beyond Leprosy. See, one of the keys with Jesus, with the leper, is that Jesus didn't see the leper the way everyone else did. The leper saw himself as a leper. Disciples saw him as a leper. His family saw him as a leper. The religious community saw him as a leper. But when Jesus saw him, he couldn't see a leper. All he saw was a man created in the image of God and deserving of the grace of God. A father has a perspective of now and eternity. And so Jesus, looking for his disciples, he, he recognized that the most important thing for them was to be truly chosen. So he goes up and prays to the Father. He, in, in consultation with the Father, comes back down the mountain, and he chose the ones that would, first of all, be with him. You know, if you're going to be a father, 
a true father, you have to be willing to be vulnerable enough to allow yourself to be seen and to be known. You can't hide out. You really can't not and be a true spiritual father. A father loves to spend time with his sons and his daughters. He loves to spend time with his family because he recognizes that they're the next generation and it's, it's our responsibility to equip them to fulfill their destiny. Secondly, he had a real purpose for them. They started as disciples, but his goal was to make them apostles, sent ones. Now, a sent one is a person that carries a message. The message comes from the Father. The Father's message to the children is know that you're loved, know that you're wanted, know that you're special. The Father's message to the young man is you are strong, you're going to be an overcomer, you're going to make it, you're going to fulfill your destiny. And their message to fellow fathers is let's continue to do what God's called us to do and raise up the next generation. So Jesus chose his 12 so that they would be apostles, sent ones with a message, and that they would have authority or power even over the devil. Well, certainly the apostles had that. We see that in Matthew chapter 10 when Jesus sent out the 12 and they went out two by two and he gave them instructions and they came back and reported, even the demons are subject to me in your name. He said, ah, I wouldn't be so impressed with that. I saw Satan fall from heaven. Just be impressed that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, fathers have the ability to have more of a heavenly perspective. It's the 30,000 foot view. We call it having, uh, a, you know, a true spiritual leadership. In fact, Vision International University in our leadership program, we have, we have five C's that we see as most important. And we've kind of covered them in our journey to wholeness. Number one is Christ. You've got to know him. Know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Be conformed even unto his death to know Christ. It's Christ and then it's community. You can't really know Christ outside a community. You need to have fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that you have relationship with. It's Christ and community together that forms our character. God wants us to have a godly character. That is to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Even apostles need to be nice to people. Even prophets need to be able to speak the truth in love. All of us that are called into areas of ministry or service, we also have to have Christian character. Then follows our calling and ultimately our competence. And God wants you to know who you are, what you're called to be, what you're called to do, but also He wants you to, to gain the skills necessary. He wants you to be able to walk in the wisdom of God wherever he's placed you. So again, John wrote, children, young men, fathers, the journey to wholeness is the journey to maturity. And my prayer for you is that you will come into the fullness of your maturity by God's grace. So again, it's my privilege to be here. Until our next time, this is Dr. Stan DeCoven with uh, Walk in Wisdom and sponsored by the Vision International University. May God bless you and keep you strong in your journey for God.